Well, folks, welcome to the University of Edinburgh. Welcome to the Institute of Sport, Physical Education and Health Sciences. Welcome to the School of Education. And for those who are joining us online from further afield, welcome to the University of Toronto and staff and students who are joining us from, from Canada. This is the final session in our seminar series for this year and um, we're delighted to have Dr. Josephine mm -hmm. Booth, more commonly known as Josie, mm -hmm. okay. to join us from the University of Dundee and uh, Josie is one of the researchers who are you know, at the forefront of a really interesting topic which she's going to share insights with us today which is uh, physical activity and education attainment, clearly of interest to the Scottish Government, if not other governments interested in closing the attainment gap. I don't know if that's what Josie is going to say, <laughs> whether physical activity will help close the educational attainment gap. I doubt it. I'm certainly, as with you, really looking forward to what she has to say and uh, a warm welcome to okay. the seminar, Josie. So we'll just hand over thanks. to you, okay. and uh, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, so thank you, everyone. It's great to see so many people here, um, and it's a real delight to be invited to come and talk to you. So thank you very much to Andy for helping arrange this. Um, so I'm going to be talking about physical activity and attainment, but before we start, I thought a couple of caveats. Um, First, as I was saying to Andy, I'm kind of getting to the end of semester, which means my voice is slowly starting to go. And um, I'm hoping it'll last for the next hour, but if anyone has any problems hearing me at the back, just give me a wave, but hopefully it'll stay with me. And um, the other important caveat that I should put in is that I'm not a physical activity specialist as such. So I'm a developmental psychologist. So all of my work has looked at how children develop, mostly looking at cognition and attainment, but within a broader spectrum. So thinking about you know, activity and diet and how that can influence cognition, but also how cognition and attainment will influence whether we do activity, the type of diet we choose, and the type of health behaviour change activity. So within a broad kind of area. So it's important to kind of get the context because I'm not an expert in terms of physiology or sports psychology, if you like. Hey. So just to put things in a little bit of context then, these are the current guidelines, which I think everybody um, in the room will be familiar with. And these guidelines are the same from the WHO, they're also the same in Canada, in Australia, and in most countries. And they recommend that children between five and 18 years old should do about 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. And that's the minimum that our children should be aspiring to do. Now, within these guidelines, this suggests then that MVPA is any activity that increases your heart rate and gets you out of breath some of the time. So that's just to kind of clarify how we're thinking about the amount of activity that we should be recommending. Now, what in reality are children doing? Now, I realise that you won't be able to see the figures on this table, so I'll try and pick them out. This is data from children at 11 years old who are reporting how, whether they're meeting the guidelines of 60 minutes of MVPA or not. Now here we've got Canada. So 31% of the 11 year old boys and 21% of the girls said that they were doing these guidelines of 60 minutes of MVPA. Just beneath them, we've got England. Further down here, we've got Wales. And sadly, from our point of view, Scotland's quite a bit further down. Okay? So in general, we can see that position of Scotland, we've got 24% of our 11 year old boys and 16% of girls saying that they're doing an hour every day. So we might think, well, that's not too bad. None of us are at the bottom. But what this says to me then is that about 84% aren't actually achieving these guidelines. So that's a huge number of 11 year olds who aren't doing as much activity as we recommend. Now the average over all these countries then was 23%. Okay? Unfortunately, as most people know, that figure gets lower as children get older. So by 15 years old, only 15% were actually meeting these guidelines. And this is a figure across most of these countries. Now, because of data such as this, then, um, we've, it's been classed as this pandemic of inactivity. So this isn't a problem just for a few countries. It seems to be a global issue that our children and adolescents aren't doing enough activity. And I'll try and put this in a bit more context then. So I'm thinking that most people here will be familiar with the, healthy active, the Active Healthy Kids Report Card, which was started off in Canada and has now been taken over by a number of countries. And it looks to classify... Mm -hmm. 
children across a range of indicators and give us some sort of measure of how we're doing. And last year there was this international comparison to say how children in Scotland were stacking up against children in other countries. Now, what we can see then is over all of these indicators, the ones in red are where Canada stack up. So we can see for overall physical activity then, Canada was given a D minus. Okay. Now, for those with very keen eyesight, you'll see down here that this means that between 21 and 40% of the children were meeting these guidelines. So that means they get awarded a D. Okay. Whereas we've got up here, New Zealand and Mozambique got awarded a B for activity, which means that more of them are doing the recommended guidelines. Now, you'll be able to see Scotland, unfortunately, gets an F. Okay. So what this means is that a very low number of children are reaching the overall guidelines. However, this is quite important data because not only does it look at overall physical activity, it also breaks it down by a few other indicators. So we've looked at organised sport, active play, active transportation, as well as another of um, other areas. Now, for most of these, you can see that Canada, for example, would get a C for organised sport participation. So more children are actually taking part in organised sport. Um, however, Scotland, there's inconclusive data for this, which means we're not very good at recording it. However, in other areas, Scotland do a little bit better. Um, for example, active transportation, we get a C. Okay? So what this means is that between 41 and 60% of our children are actually using active transport. Okay? And I think that this is one of the few ones where we get higher than Canada. Okay? So we're not doing awfully unless we look at the overall activity. So in some areas, we're doing a little bit better. Other areas, we're not doing so well. Okay? And actually, some other Canadian data said that although they're getting a D for overall activity, when you break this down by age, it's a little bit of a bleaker picture. So only 7% of 5 to 11-year-olds are meeting the recommended guidelines of activity, and even less 4% of their 12 to 17-year-olds. So really quite low numbers of children actually meeting the recommended guidelines. Now, I promise this is the only horrible table of numbers that I'm going to put in. Okay? But this data was published last week, so I thought it was really relevant for me to try and highlight it. So this data looks at the health behaviour of school-aged children, and it looks at the trends over time, so between 2002 and 2010. And it looks at trends and in international comparisons, as it was published on the 24th of March, so really quite relevant. And what this data is trying to pick out is whether our activity levels are stable or not, or whether there has been any improvements. Now, what you can see for Canada, then, is these circles indicate that there's been no change overall in the proportion of children who are meeting the recommended guidelines between 2002 and 2010. Fortunately, Scotland is down here. Okay? And you might not be able to see the numbers, but hopefully this line will let you and um, will indicate that actually the amount of children who are reaching the guidelines is going down in Scotland between 2002 and 2010. Now, hopefully that has picked up again if we look at more recent data. But what this shows is that the trend in Canada is pretty stable. And in Scotland, unfortunately, we're getting a little bit worse. Okay? So despite the fact that we're becoming more aware of activity being an issue, we don't seem to be able to encourage the changes that are required. Okay. Now I'm also going to talk briefly about weight, so I thought that was important to put into context a bit here. Um, now there's evidence that shows that low there's a relationship between low levels of activity and higher weight. Okay? Um, we know that it's not a straightforward linear relationship, because okay? we know that you can do recommended guidelines of activity, but if your calorie intake is loads more, you could still be overweight. Okay? So I'm not suggesting it's a straightforward relationship. But for a lot of the population, low levels of activity will lead to higher weight. Okay? Now, these figures are from the 2013 Child Measurement Programme in the UK. And what they show is the percentage of children at five years old who are overweight or obese. So what we can see here then is that in Wales, 12.5% of their five-year-olds are classed as obese. So these are really quite terrifying statistics. Okay? Now, also published last week as part of the trends looking at the health behaviour of school-aged children data, looked at the proportion of change. And this data shows that there is no significant change in the proportion of children who are overweight in either Canada or Scotland between 2002 and 2010. So while we're not getting worse, we're certainly not getting any better. So there seems to be something stable for the most part in terms of weight, but we're not actually managing to encourage any positive change. Now in 2004, the WHO said that 
urgent action was required and they haven't really yet retracted the statement. So we still need urgent action in order to encourage activity and encourage healthy weight amongst our children and adolescents. So this means it's really, really important that we're trying to encourage this positive change. Yeah. Now, I believe most people in this room will be familiar with the benefits of physical activity in terms of health indicators. So it reduces your risk of many chronic conditions. So just a few, stroke, type 2 diabetes, cancer, obesity, musculoskeletal conditions will all be improved through physical activity. There's also a really strong link between childhood obesity and premature mortality and morbidity. So if you're, over, if you're obese in childhood, you're more likely to die earlier. Okay? Now that to me is pretty strong reason for why we should be encouraging our children to be more active. But as we can see in the previous slides then, that doesn't seem to be enough motivation for many people. Now a recent study looking at the EPIC um, cohorts, so this is about 330,000 adults that were tracked for 12 years across Europe. And this data showed that mortality was reduced by between 16 and 30% for those who are moderately inactive compared to those who are completely inactive. So this is a difference from doing about a 20 minute walk a day. So not huge amounts of activity, but that can reduce your, the mortality by 16 to 30%. So that's quite stark evidence again. Okay? Now, as well as all of this kind of health benefits then, Increased physical activity is also associated with psychological and educational benefits. And it's these that I'm going to be talking to you um, about today. Now, I'm going to be focusing on children, but it's important to say that these benefits are evident across the lifespan. So it's not just in childhood, that throughout adulthood, physical activity is beneficial for you psychologically as well. Okay. So let's think about the evidence then for the psychological benefits. So in 2011, Biddle and Azari conducted a review of reviews. So they looked at all the meta-analyses and meta-analyzed them. Okay? And so they wanted to try and bring together all of the literature that was looking at physical activity in children and young people. And what they reported then was increased physical activity reduces your risk of depression. It reduced the risk of anxiety. It led to increased self-esteem, increased cognition, so attention processes and memory and increased academic attainment. So quite a wide range of benefits from increased activity. However, they cautioned that the evidence was quite limited. So many of the studies were small, many of them were cross-sectional, and many of them relied on self-report measures rather than objective measures of physical activity. So although we have some indication of really positive impact of activity, there's not completely conclusive from this review. Now, I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by cognition. Um, but it's important to say that there's been numerous findings to suggest that there's a cognitive um, improvement from doing activity. And this is in both adults and children. So the two most commonly cited meta-analyses then um, suggest that the effect size in adults is about 0.7, so about a moderate effect. And in children, it's about 0.32. So again, that's a kind of a moderate effect size. Um, and this was irrespective of the type of activity that was being done. So physical activity led to improvements in cognition, regardless of the type of activity that children were doing. Okay? However, what was interesting then is that there were differences depending on the type of cognition. So whether studies had looked at IQ, or whether they looked at educational attainment, or whether they looked at processes called executive functions. And I'll explain what I mean by executive functions in a moment. Okay? So that seems to be, depending on the outcome, that there might be slight differences in terms of the effect. Okay? And actually, the most promising effect sizes have been found for executive functions. So it seems to be something special about these that lead to uh, physical activity will lead to improved imp uh, performance, especially. So what are executive functions then? Well, they're generally termed as the underlying processes which are involved in cognitive functioning. Okay? So for anyone who's not you know, had a background in cognitive functioning, that might be a little bit of a, a difficult um, definition. But it's an umbrella term. It's looking at the type of cognitive functions such as working memory, attention, inhibition, planning, shifting your focus between different courses of action, and these sorts of attentional processes. We use them every day. We, you're using them at the moment to pay attention to what I'm saying while you're ignoring everything else that's going on around you. These sorts of higher order cognitive processes. Okay? Now they're really important because they've been implicated in a wide range of areas of learning, such as vocabulary, learning to read, mathematics, science learning. And there's some longitudinal research that shows that your executive function performance is more predictive in the long term of academic attainment than IQ measures are. 
Okay? And this is across the population, also for children who might have developmental problems. So executive functions are really important in terms of learning about our um, attainment in school. Now, this uh, review in 2013 showed that there is a relationship between physical activity and executive functions across the lifespan. It's not just in children or adolescents, it's also in adults and older adults as well. So actually, these executive processes seem to be especially sensitive to physical activity. Hmm. So just to tease this apart a little bit more then, physical activity then seems to be related more to some aspects of executive function than it is to others. So, for example, studies that have looked at planning, so whether we can effectively plan out a course of action, um, seem to be especially, they benefit from more physical activity. Whereas there's less consistent effects in terms of looking at our memory and our attentional processes, but there's certainly a trend in the literature. Okay? However, many studies lack, again, this objective measurement of activity, and they also lack don't always look at a range of executive function tasks. So they rely very heavily on one particular task rather than looking at a range of processes. So there's some sort of you know, need for more consistent research in the literature. Okay. Focusing then on attainment a bit more. In 2012, a review was carried out looking at the long-term impact of physical activity on school attainment. Okay. And it concluded that there was a real dearth of high quality studies Okay. and that no studies used objective measurements when looking at this long-term relationship. However, they did conclude there was a positive relationship in general, but again, they were cautioned about this lack of good quality evidence. So across the literature then, we seem to be seeing very positive trends and positive relationships, but a real lack of high quality evidence. Okay. So... This is data from an EEG scan, which looks at your, um, I guess, looks at the brain. Okay? I'm not going to go into huge details about this. And you don't need to be an expert to be able to see that there's a difference between these two pictures. Okay? So the picture on the left shows your brain after sitting quietly. So this is probably what your brain all looks like just now. And on the right, this is after 20 minutes walking. So we can see just by the change in the colors that there's more activation within the brain after 20 minute walk. Okay. So this sort of change in the brain seems to account for improvements in attention that we see just after going and having a walk at lunchtime, for example. So because of these sorts of changes, it's important to think about whether this might have an impact over the long term. If we see this sort of change after just 20 minutes, might it be the case that children who are doing more activity over a longer period actually have an increased improvement or not? Okay. So our research then aims to really address these limitations in the literature. So we wanted to look at the long-term relationships between physical activity and obesity and looking at cognition and attainment. And we focused on both of these areas. And we did this looking at data from the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. And I'll explain a bit more about what that is. So ALSPAC, or Children of the 90s, it's called, um, is a longitudinal cohort study. Um, and in 1991, they aimed to recruit all pregnant women in the former county of Avon, so in and around Bristol in the south of England. And they managed to recruit 14,541 pregnant women. So a huge sample of women were recruited. And they were about 12 weeks gestation, so early stages of pregnancy. Okay? Now, these women are still being followed now. So they've collected really detailed information from the mothers and also from the children. And now they're starting to look at the children of the children because a few of them are starting to have their own families. And so it's a fantastic resource. They've collected information objectively as well as um, from data linkage. So they've collected questionnaire data. They've also done data extraction from medical records, looking at um, data linkage from routine information systems, from school records, and a wide range of data sources as well as they also ran research clinics for the children. So every couple of years, children were invited to come in and have more detailed measurements taken. Okay? So the information I'm going to be talking about today focuses on the cohort when they were between 11 and 16 years old. So at 11 years old, just over 7,000 were invited to come to one of these in-focus clinics. And they had information collected over a wide range of areas. So objective measurements were taken of height, weight, body fat, hearing, vision, grip strength. They also filled out questionnaires about their friendships, about you know, their well-being. 
they also took part in lots of cognitive tests as well. So a really wide range of areas of information taken. Now, as part of this in focus group, just over 6,000 agreed to have their physical activity monitored using objective measurements. Um, so they all wore an actigraph for a week. Um, and this collected physical activity data. Um, and it was recorded in counts per minute. And most people here are familiar with accelerometers, I think. Yeah, good. So I won't go into a huge detail, but the accelerometer data was used to calculate their average daily minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. They also kept a diary of times that they were swimming and cycling and things like that because the actigraph had to be taken off for these sorts of activities. Okay. Now, from this sample then, about 5,500 actually submitted valid data. So this was at least three days' wear for at least 10 hours per day. Okay. So quite a large sample with objective measurement, good quality accelerometer data. So they had a mean age of 140 months. Um, the sample was not terribly ethnically diverse, so 98% white. Um, but this is systematic of Bristol at the time. Um, in terms of weight status then, so BMI um, Z scores were calculated. So looking at their, um, in reference to UK 1990 reference population data. Um, and because of that, the sample then was about 70% healthy weight, 13% overweight, and about 16, 15, 16% obese. So quite typical of the population of that particular time in and around Bristol. Okay. So as part of these in-focus clinics then, they took part in a range of cognitive measures. And they're very attentionally focused measures. This is an example of one, which is from the test of everyday attention for children, which is a standardized measure of attention. Um, it's called the sky search task. I'm hoping that you can see these are pictures of rockets. Okay? Not sure if you believe me, but they are. Okay? And the task was that you had to circle the pairs where there's two of the same type of rocket. Okay? So that might sound quite straightforward. The instructions are you go along the page, top to bottom, left to right. You've got a stranger sitting at you with a stopwatch telling you to go as fast as you can. Okay? Maybe not too hard. Um, and you have to ignore all of the distracting ones. So it's very much about focusing visual attention. Now, the second part of this task, then, is at the same time as you're trying to do this challenging task, you are also played the noise of rocket ships. So a kind of wee and woo would go off every few seconds. And while you're trying to circle these rockets, you also have to count the number of times you hear a rocket. Okay? So it's about trying to do these two tasks in parallel. Okay? So again, some people will be going, oh, that sounds easy. And other people will be going, oh, there's no way I could do that. Okay? Um, and all this, you have to remember, they're 11 years old. And it's quite a challenging condition to be doing these sorts of tasks. Now, they also did one task, what's called the opposite world task. Um, this time, the first part of this task is quite straightforward. You have to go along this series of numbers, joining um, them sequentially. So you say a 1 to 1, a 2 to 2, and join at the numbers this way. However, then you have to inhibit that response and change. And this time, you say a 2 to a 1 and a 1 to a 2. So you have to remember which way around you have to respond to the numbers and also join them up at the same time as responding verbally. Okay? So again, a little bit of having to pay attention and really focus on what you're trying to do. You have to remember the instructions, and you also have to ignore the distraction that you've already been doing. Okay? So a little bit of a complex task. Now, at 13 years old, slightly different tasks were um, performed, unfortunately, but they were. Um, this time they were on a computer, which is quite interesting. Um, and they started off by just looking at kind of simple reaction time tasks. So having to press a particular button when the word yes appeared, okay, and not press a button when the word no appeared. So just to try and get them used to pressing the button or not. The second set then was a choice reaction time task. So this time you had to respond by either choosing pressing a left or a right button, and you had to choose which one was the appropriate response. Okay. The third part of this task was then a digit vigilance task. This time you would see two digits on the computer screen. One would stay still and the one in the middle would rotate. When they match, you have to press the button. Okay? So for example, you would press when there's two sixes, but you wouldn't press when there's an eight and a six. Okay? So again, very much having to kind of focus attention on what you're doing and ignore the distracting information. Okay. Now, as well as these more kind of cognitive and attention tasks, then, data linkage was taking place, looking at nationally administered school assessments. Um, so these are SATs, which all children in England take part in. Um, 
And these were stats that were done at age 11, 13 and 16. So these are their GCSE results. So objective measurements of their school attainment. Right. In terms of analysis then, we performed a series of hierarchical regression analyses. And because of the breadth of the all-SPAC cohort and the information that had been collected since gestation, we were able to control for a really wide range of confounders. So we took into account age, birth weight, gestation, age of mother, ethnicity. We also were able to take into account mother's oily fish intake during pregnancy, because we know that this has an impact on brain development. We also looked at whether the mother smoked during pregnancy, maternal education and social class, children's BMI Z score, so relevant reference to the population data, pubertal stage and total volume of activity. So we're able to take into account a really wide range of confounders that no studies had been able to do previously. Hmm? So just to give you a little bit of um, an idea of the kind of results here, the average daily minutes of MVPA for the sample was 29 minutes for boys and 18 minutes for girls. So that's the average. So pretty low levels of physical activity at 11 years old. Um, I think there was about four or five that were actually doing the hour. So really low levels. Okay? Um, in terms of their attainment, then these are the, kind of av the average attainment scores, which are roughly what we would expect in terms of their achievement. So they're a fairly standard population in terms of their school achievement and pretty low in terms of how much activity they were doing. Okay. So a series of regression analyses were um, performed and the results that I'm going to show um, indicate physical activity up to 11 years old, predicting executive function and then attainment. Um, we were looking at standardised tests for the executive function at 11 years old. So what this means is in all cases here, higher performance is better. Okay. Now what this um, table shows then is the direction of the beta coefficients. Okay. So an uh, arrow going up the way shows that physical activity predicted increased attainment. An arrow going down is that physical activity predicted decreased attainment. Um, and the green arrow shows that it was statistically significant after adjustment for the full range of confounding variables. And I should say that we found before adjustment all relationships were statistically significant. Okay? So what we can see here, if we start off by looking at the males, we can see across those range of cognitive tests at 11 years old, higher physical activity predicted better performance. However, it was for only two of the tasks that there was, was still statistically significant after controlling for the full range of confounders. But that's pretty still convincing evidence that more activity was reflected in better performance. However, for the girls, it's a little bit inconsistent here. And what we see is that generally, after controlling for the confounders, it was only for that opposite worlds task, where you're saying the one to the two and two to the one, that was still highly statistically significant. So we see a suggestion for females, but in the boys, it was a bit more convincing. Okay. Now, in terms of the, activity, the um, executive performance at 13, again, things are a little bit more inconsistent. Now, this time, we weren't looking at standardised performance. So for this top speed variable, a lower score is better because they were responding more quickly, whereas for accuracy, uh, arrow pointing up the way is a better performance because we want them to have increased accuracy. So what we can see, again, with the females, we see... The, the findings didn't hold up to confounding. So when we took into account all of those confounding relationships, they were no longer statistically significant. However, for the boys, in terms of accuracy, so how well they were able to pay attention, we found that physical activity at 11 predicted increased performance. So only a two-year gap, but those who were doing more activity at 11 years old had stronger cognitive performance at 13. Okay. Now, this graph, again, is orientated the same sort of way, but shows the results of academic attainment at 16. So this is physical activity at 11, predicting academic attainment five years later. And what we can see is a much stronger picture here, that across all of the subjects of English, maths and science, higher activity predicted better attainment five years later for both boys and girls. And that for, especially for girls, when we controlled for all confounders, these were all still highly statistically significant. And I haven't put the results here, but the pattern was exactly the same at 11 and 13 years old. So physical activity at 11 predicted increased academic attainment at 11 and 13 and 16 years old. So a long-term relationship between the <coughs> amount of activity and increased attainment. Okay. 
we also found some evidence for a dose response effect. Um, and this graph kind of highlights this. So the sample were sp split into quintiles based on the amount of activity that they were doing at 11 years old. And these quintiles were used to predict their English GCSE results, so five years later. Okay? Um, so this is the results from a regression, and the least active group is our reference group. So the graph shows how the other groups did in comparison to the least active group. Okay? So what we can see then is that the children who were most active at 11 years old had substantially greater um, outcome in terms of their academic performance than those who were the least active. Okay? So we can see that there's this nice dose response effect here. And when we control for all confounders, it was only the most active group that was statistically having better performance than those who were the least active. Okay? So there certainly seems to be a suggestion that those who are doing more activity were doing a lot better than those who were the least active. And I know that this is quite small, but this shows the number of minutes of MVPA per day. And I should say that even the most active group, the boys were doing 55 minutes a day, and the most active girls were averaging 37 minutes a day. Okay? So pretty low levels of activity across these groups. Okay. So what do these findings really tell us then? So we find that MVPA was associated with better performance of school over the long term. In terms of how big an effect, it seemed to vary depending on the subject and also the gender. Roughly, we find though that an increase of 15 minutes of MVPA led to about a quarter of a grade increase in terms of GCSEs. Okay? So that might not sound much, but we have to remember that that's five years later and that's taking into, um, into account all of those confounding variables. We still find about a quarter of a grade increase. We also find that MVPA was related to improved attentional skills as well. But we have to remember that these findings are in the context of really low levels of activity in this sample and that potentially if they were doing more activity we might have seen greater effects and we actually really need to do an RCT in order to determine this. Okay? It's important to say though that this isn't a completely linear relationship so we don't think that the kids who are doing four hours of activity are suddenly going to be Mensa candidates, you know, it's not quite as straightforward. Okay? But we do see this general dose response effect. Okay. Now, briefly, I'm going to talk about the relationship between weight status as well. So we also looked at their weight at 11 years old and whether that predicted their academic attainment. And this was controlling for those wide range of confounders. It also controlled for the amount of MVPA that they were doing as well. Okay? Now, pretty consistently, you can see then that those who were overweight and obese had a trend for lower performance and, than those who are the healthy weight. However, when we control for those wide range of confounders, it was really only those who were obese who had a uh, lower performance than those of a healthy weight, and mostly in the girls. Okay? So while there was a bit of a suggestion for the boys, it was really for the girls at 11, uh, 13 and 16 years old that had substantially lower performance if they were obese at 11 years old than those of a healthy weight. Now this might make this a bit clearer. So we looked at change in weight status. So the change in their weight between 11 years old and 16 years old and we grouped them into those in this column who were stable, overweight and obese. That means that they were always in that category between 11 and 16. Those who had been a healthy weight at 11, but then were in the overweight category at 16. We also have those who were healthy weight at 11 and then were obese by the time they were 16. We also have another group who were overweight at 11 and then became obese by the time they were 16. And those who were um, overweight or obese at 11 and then actually lost weight and became a healthy weight. Okay? Now in all cases this is in reference to the stable healthy weight group. Okay? So imagine that zero is our stable healthy weight. In all of these cases then you can see that um, those who were stel stable overweight or obese and those who were became obese had substantially lower performance than those who have a stable healthy weight and that was five six years later. So this in terms of their GCSC performance. Okay. And the asterisks indicate that these relationships are still highly statistically significant when we control for all of those confounders. So we can see then that actually those who were overweight over a longer term had substantially lower performance than those who were of a healthy weight. Okay. So what does this tell us then? Well, we see that there's this long-term detrimental effect of obesity on academic attainment, most substantially in the girls. There's certainly a trend for the boys, but it didn't hold up to all these confounding variables. Okay. 
Now, we also conducted a number of mediation analysis, and we found that depressive symptoms, IQ, and age of menarche didn't mediate the relationship. So none of these variables that we think should have an impact actually con um, took, uh, were statistically significant mediators. So what we can see then is those who are overweight or obese had a lower long-term performance than those who are of the healthy weight. Okay? And those who became overweight, uh, became obese, didn't perform lower than those who are the stable, healthy weight. So it's something about being overweight and obese over the long term that seems to be especially detrimental to performance. Okay? In terms of how big an effect, we find again about a third of a grade at age 16 for the girls. Okay? So uh, being able to influence your uh, attainment five years on to a third of a grade is quite a substantial of impact. Okay? So with this sample, this was sufficient to lower attainment to a D instead of a C, which was the average for that sample. Okay. So how does this fit into the existing literature then? So in 2011, Davis reported results from a randomized control trial, and they also reported a dose-response effect for MVPA. So they had an intervention group who did 40 minutes of activity, and they had a better performance than, those, than the control group. However, they found no difference between those who did 20 minutes of activity and the control group. So again, this dose response. Now, if we think about our findings, when those who were the most active had better performance, we can see that the boys were doing 40 minutes, but even our most active girls weren't quite doing these 40 minutes. So this suggests that we actually need to be doing a bit more activity in order to see more substantial findings. In terms of the obesity findings being quite focused on the girls, this fits in quite well with the rest of the existing literature then. So there's a few studies that have also found an adverse effect of obesity in girls particularly. This longitudinal study reported in 1994 found that adolescent obesity at 16 was associated with fewer years of schooling, lower income in adulthood and um, a wide range of negative factors but only for the girls, not for the boys. So it seems to be that girls are especially prone to negative consequences of obesity in terms of their attainment. So a few considerations then. It's not clear what type of activity they were doing. We used accelerometers, but they didn't record a diary of all of the activity, so we can't be sure what type. We also don't know how much time they spent studying, which is a limitation. And we were unable to control for all potential mediators. So we took into account a lot, but we also couldn't look at things like self-esteem or absenteeism, and these sorts of factors. It's been suggested then that those at the lowest starting point might actually benefit the most from any sort of interventions. And I'll come to that in a moment. But there's a suggestion that physical activity might help to level the playing field in terms of those who have a lower starting point at school. Okay. However, a few questions remain in terms of how physical activity really leads to these benefits. Now, there's been a few possible mechanisms muted in the literature. Um, and I'll try and talk about a few. So firstly, it could be the biological reasoning that physical activity leads to an increase in blood flow in the brain, as we saw from that nice picture. Also can change the neurotransmitters in the brain and that this might lead to a positive impact in terms of attainment. There's also the kind of cognitive side, that it's really that we're increasing attentional processes. That means you can do better in school because you can actually focus on the work you're doing. And this means that you then have better attentional scores and um, attainment scores. There's also the psychosocial aspect as well, though, that maybe physical activity, those who are doing more, have better self-esteem, they're absent less, and they also have better relationships with their peers and their teachers. And actually, this is maybe why they've got better attainment. And there's also suggestions about the type of activity that's being done. So the outdoor environment seems to be especially positive in terms of mental health. There's also a benefit from doing group activities as opposed to individual activities. And we wonder if this might actually lead to the increases in attainment. And also thinking about the type of activity, whether it involves kind of rule-based and more complex types of processes and how this is especially important in terms of cognition. Okay. So I want to talk briefly about some interventions just to try and set the scene a little bit. I know I'm kind of pushed for time. Okay. Um, so firstly, a couple of... Um, interventions that were conducted in Canada. Um, so in 2000s then, weak associations were reported between physical activity and attainment in 6,000 um, students in Canada. Further then, increasing school activity was found to not be detrimental to attainment. So a bit cautious here, 
about the findings, but they did conclude strongly that at least increasing activity wouldn't make children's attainment suffer. And this was in light of the fact that it's schools are often under pressure to reduce time on activities so that they can concentrate on more academic subjects. Okay? So these are both were Canadian students. However, we've, then the literature has moved on a bit. In terms of younger children then, we found that in terms of interventions, increasing MVPA leads to improvement in executive function in young children. And that more recently, an after-school programme led to improvements in terms of inhibition and cognitive flexibility. And this is echoed in terms of brain scans as well. More recently last year, this is a Swedish study by Cal and colleagues who found that increasing PE time led to school and um, improvements in school performance. So this was within school time. They just doubled the amount of PE that was being done. Okay? So from two hours to four hours. They didn't change the type of PE or make any other adjustments. They just increased it. And they found across the board that there was increases in terms of school attainment. So just quite simple. It might not be having to change the type of activity, but just actually making sure kids are doing a bit more. Okay? What's interesting then is thinking about the idea that children with the lowest starting point might benefit the most. Okay? Now, we know that children who've got developmental problems such as ADHD or reading difficulties start school with lower executive function performance. And so potentially they might benefit even more from interventions in terms of increasing activity. However, there's a real positive research that's looked at this, although initial findings seem to be quite positive that if we can increase activity for these groups in particular, we might see increased cognitive performance. Hmm? It's also been suggested then that physical activity might have a similar benefit to psychostimulant medication. And I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but it's enough to say that medication for ADHD costs the NHS millions every year. So actually, if physical activity can have a similar benefit, this might be a, not an alternative treatment, but an, another useful mechanism Okay. So briefly, just thinking about activity levels in ADHD. So people with ADHD often experience deficits in terms of motor abilities. And we know that children who've got motor difficulties are likely to be less physically active. And so it shouldn't be a surprise then that there's lower levels of physical activity for those who've got ADHD. Obesity is also really common in those with ADHD, which seems counterintuitive because when we think about cases with ADHD, we're thinking about them moving all of the time. Okay? However, the prevalence rates are really high. So between 13 and 50% of kids who've got ADHD are obese. So quite hard numbers. We also know that there's big executive function impairments in children with ADHD. And this might be especially sensitive to the, um, obesity as well. Hmm? Potentially, there's a shared neural mechanism. So we know that obesity biologically has an impact on the brain. And it might be that the, func the areas of the brain are especially sensitive for ADHD. And studies have also shown that physical activity is beneficial for particular processes in kids who've got ADHD. So a range of research then shown that this might be quite an important avenue of research. So we've been conducting an intervention then for kids with ADHD and reading difficulties. And we wanted to look at the relationship between activity and executive functions and attainment, but also social and emotional behaviour to see if actually our intervention would lead to improvements for these kids. We wanted to look at kids with ADHD, also reading difficulties and those with co-occurring ADHD because these are highly comorbid disorders. Um, and we wanted to pilot a physical activity intervention and see if there was an impact in these areas and whether it differed from group to group. So just briefly then, as this was a pilot study, we had quite small numbers, but we had 15 children with ADHD, 15 with reading problems, 15 with co-occurring ADHD and RD, and 23 controls, all aged between 9 and 12 years old. And we used a delayed control design, meaning that our control group then received the intervention at a later stage. So we had collected data at baseline, then we had a 12-week intervention, and then a post-test for both groups. Now, this physical activity intervention is focusing on increasing MVPA with an additional cognitive load. And this is based on research by Tom Porowski and colleagues, and they've recently published a book almost manualising this type of intervention. And I should say, these are pictures that the kids drew for Ian, my um, RA who conducted the intervention because apparently they just loved it so much that they wanted to draw in pictures to thank him for it. So I put a few of those in. Okay. Now the intervention we adapted for use with ADHD and it focuses on games across three different areas. So contextual interference, um, mental control and principles of discovery. So in all cases, 
It's about increasing the number of rules in terms of it could be travel rules. So the first corner of the court you have to hop, the second corner you have to bunny hop, the third corner you have to run backwards, these sorts of complex instructions. And the instructor poses questions and tries to elicit awareness of strategies. So trying to put a cognitive load on the activity that's being done as well as increasing the amount of activity. Okay. Now just to briefly give you some descriptive statistics then, we have usable data from a reasonable sample. Um, this shows how much MVPA they were doing. And we can see that across all groups, they were doing roughly about an hour of MVPA a day. So pretty, not too bad, we thought, for our sample. There's some variation, but we think that this is mostly sort of seasonal adjustments. Okay? So you can see that for most groups, which is interesting given that we would generally think of kids with ADHD as doing less activity than our typically developing group. Now I'm just going to show you some really preliminary findings from this. This table shows the effect size, the difference between the pre and post test scores for our intervention group and the control group. And what we can see especially is that for working memory, there's quite a substantial increase as a, a moderate effect size for the intervention group that's not there for the control group. So taking part in this activity intervention seems to lead to improved performance for working memory across these groups. Now we've also conducted ANCOVA, looking at post-test scores while we've controlled for pre-test scores. And we still see the significant effect for working memory. We also see interaction. So there's a special improvements for the ADHD group and those with co-occurring difficulties. And we see a trend for the other groups, but it's not quite statistically significant. Okay. So these preliminary findings then suggests that there's improvement in some areas for those who receive this physical activity intervention and that there's group differences emerging and that there are some interaction effects. So this is quite exciting because this shows that just by increasing um, MVPA with this cognitive load, we can lead to improvements in terms of cognition and attainment for these groups. But it also suggests that the physical activity um, impact is not uniform across all areas of difficulty. So it seems to be more beneficial for some groups than it is for others. Okay? And we need to take some caution in interpreting these results. We're still doing some work in terms of modelling the data. And I'm going to be presenting that at ISBNPA in June, if anyone's going to be there and wants to hear more about that data. OK, so just to try and wrap that all up then. Okay, basically, all of this research shows then is physical activity is beneficial for cognition and attainment. And it's over a long term in children and adolescents. We also can see then that potentially this can lead to improvements in a range of areas for those who've got developmental problems. And we know that in most typical classrooms, you'll have a range of kids with a lot of different needs. So there's likely to be a large number of kids with ADHD, but also reading problems and other behavioral issues. So actually increasing physical activity and it being beneficial for all of these children is something really, really, really positive. However, we definitely need to have a definitive RCT in order to show this. And this is what we're trying to do at the moment. Okay? Now, in 2010, then, the US Center for Disease Control suggested that schools and parents require a much stronger stake in physical activity in order to make the changes required. So the really low levels of activity, we need to have more motivation if we're going to increase the levels. And actually, we think that this evidence of a relationship with attainment and cognition might actually be the stake that parents and schools need and might help us lead to the increases in terms of activity that we desperately need. Okay, so I just want to finish by thanking my collaborators and our funders and thanking you all for listening. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dozy. I enjoyed Thank you. Did you notice? Oh, I'll sit so I'm not in the line. Folks, that was great. Um, just a, a tour of the force by so I'm sure there's a number of questions that you want to ask and we have experts in the room as well. So if they're all coming at once, we'll take them in ones and twos and threes. But if there's individual questions that people want to ask, then please feel free to, to find a way. So who wants to to kick us off? I'll go first of that. Andy. Josie, thanks very much. That was very standard. Absolutely brilliant, uh, especially for myself, because obviously it's, it's in my area of the thesis, which is really exciting. Uh, one of the things that I've come across with research when it comes to the measurements that are used to try to identify the limits of physical activity, executive function skills in particular, or just cognition, 
is the recognised thing that for males in particular, standardised tests are typically better set up for males to be better in compared to a prolonged period of work where girls typically do better. So typically girls are achieving higher scores at 10, 11, 12 years of age academically in school, where boys would achieve higher for standardised test scores. What do you think are the reasons for that? What do we know from the research that accounts for that? Is it just a maturation process of the frontal lobe and executive function skills? Or are there other mediators? I think that a lot of it is to do with the age that you're looking at. So we know that there's a big increase in terms of frontal lobe development with the onset of puberty. And because girls start that earlier, that's why we see an increase, especially 11, 12 years old, it seems to be quite sensitive area. So we see a sudden um, sort of spurt in terms of the, the neural connections, if you like, around that age. So we think that that might be especially important age in order to intervene. So if we're going to increase activity around that sort of 10, 11 years old, that might be especially sensitive. We also see the sort of spurt in terms of neural development earlier, so sort of six, seven years old, and then again at 15, 16. So there seems to be these sorts of jumps where they suddenly get better, and we think that that might be why you see these changes. But yeah, I totally take on board that we're saying in terms of standardized tests that boys better, and our results totally reflect that the boys were doing, or there was a greater performance for the boys in terms of physical activity to the relationship, so, and then the team was more for girls. And how do we think that's going to change the message that we tell parents, <coughs> trying to show them that increases in physical activity will improve executive function skills and improve academic attainment if there are those differences between gender. I think the key thing that we weren't able to model in our data, and partly this is because of the limitations of the executive function measures, because they weren't the best measures we could have had, but it was a huge cohort and we were limited, um, is that in most cases, executive performance will predict academic performance. So actually, even if the boys were seeing that this fact of the cognition, and the girls with a increasing attainment, you can still see this long-term knock-on effect. And there was a study Van Dyke and colleagues last year where they looked, they tested the mediational path and they did see that there was this mediation there. Thank you very much. Um, I had a related question actually, but it was to do with um, the image you showed of brain activity after 20 minutes of exercise or something like that. Um, because I was wonder, wondering if that is um, uh, dependent on gender and whether any observations, actually direct EEG observations, have been made of brain activity on different genders at different ages. To my knowledge, I don't think there's been any gender differences found in terms of the acute impact of activity in that age, but I could definitely double check that. But my understanding is that there's no real gender impact. And so that um, the diagram I showed is from adults, but similar observations have been found and the Hillman group have done a lot in terms of looking at brain scans at kind of 11, 12 years old and we still see this impact, especially with acute activity. And the intervention I talked about reported similar findings for a longitudinal intervention, but they didn't find any gender differences there either. So it's interesting to try and marry up those two ideas that there might be some gender differences, but it's not coming out in terms of acute which is why we think that there's a bit more going on there that we need to explore. So when you said that um, you can recognise cognitive spurts at different ages, that's based on laboratory exercises or something like that, isn't it? In terms yeah. of, uh, the spurt we're talking about in terms of neural development? Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, so that's based mostly on fMRI data Which as is well. What? Sorry, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, oh. So basically taking a brain scan um, which won't look at changes over time, but it will look at the composition of the brain. So doing an fMRI scan, you put somebody into the scanner and ask them to do a particular cognitive task, and you can see where the activation in the brain is. Okay. And you can see through those sorts of tasks the brain development changes as the brain matures over time. I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. Thank you, thank you Josie, that was really interesting. I'm really interested in the um, application of what you found, it was really good to hear about the intervention study. I just wondered, were there any challenges that you faced at taking that into school and any resistance from teachers, were they all on board, how did, how did that go? Um, yes, I guess is the short answer <laughs> that there are lots of challenges. I guess um, 
it was, it was interesting. We were working with a few different schools, and schools vary hugely in terms of the, just the ethos and the, I think even just the motivation of the teachers themselves. And we did find in one school in particular that the teachers found it very difficult to step back and let us take over in terms of their class. And it was one class that had a number of kids with quite profound areas of difficulty. And for them, their ethos is, you need to sit down and listen to the teacher, whereas we were saying, no, you need to keep moving. And we were trying to get as much movement out of the whole um, you know, hour slot that we had. We were aiming to get 40 minutes of MVPA mm -hmm. out of that. We were just under that, but trying to get them moving as much as we can. So rather than having the traditional classroom idea where you come into a group and you sit down and you listen to instructions, we were trying to get them to jog around in a circle while they were answering questions and things. So it's just very different. Um, and some teachers responded really well to that, and others find it just a bit more unusual and different from their normal style. So yeah, we certainly did find that a challenge. And, and it was a good opportunity for me to go into schools and really sit down and engage with the teachers. Um, and once they had more information about what we were trying to achieve, they were much more able to discuss it back. But I think that's quite hard as a classroom teacher to just let someone else take over your class. So that, I think that is a challenge for this type of work. Um, but yeah, we still managed to find some really positive results. And some teachers said we're so accepting to it. Think about like using physical activity interventions to enhance the relationship between children and their teachers. I'm wondering what kind of have you tried different kind of activities or a different kind of sport and which one or which type of sport is more like more effective than others? That's a good question. Yeah, we didn't look at changes in particular types of sport and we were looking more at um, Changing so the intervention we've got uses games across a number of areas, and um, and each week you have a different sort of area. So one week it was focusing and um, on the really kind of mental control, if you like, and um, and so the games would be focused on that. So we haven't yet teased apart week by week whether there was more or less of a relationship. And um, but I think that there is some suggestion in the literature about different types of sports and how that can have. An impact. So whether team sports like rugby or football have a, a stronger impact on cognition than um, sports that are less complex, like I was going to say swimming, I'm not being derogatory to swimming, you know, but it's less wheel based if you like. So there's some sort of relationship there in the literature, but it's quite difficult because for many kids they don't just do one sport. You know, so the, the kids that are on the rugby team will also be the ones that go swimming once a week and also be the ones that then kick around the football and things like that. Whereas in adults, we tend to focus more and we'll do a couple of sports that are more our kind of thing, if you like. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but there's a bit of a messy look to turn that around. Yeah. I think you comment on policy traction of your work and the policy resistance to your work. I mean, politicians are jump on anything if you feel that improvement is made. Clearly this is a, a huge area of interest. Yeah. Um, and I hear you saying through your talk, a number of things just jumped yeah. out to me which were really interesting that um, there was a study in Sweden where you said there was immediate benefit just from simply went from two to four hours. But you would not get that in Scotland, would you? No. Do you want to comment on that? Policy context in terms of if you could, if you had a blank piece of paper to help Scotland or Canada, what would you, what would you do? I think it's quite a chance. Of, you know, so we're, Andy and I were talking about the fact that we're getting better at this. You know, two hours of quality PE. You might be getting two hours of PE. It might not be high quality though in terms of all schools, and that's because many class teachers don't feel that they've got the expertise necessarily in order to to bring those sorts of changes about. So I think that there's a real need in terms of Scotland for you know, increased training and support for teachers. So it can be quality PE and not just two hours of PE. We also know that if you look at a typical hour of PE, that's not an hour of movement. You know, it's like five minutes of getting changed out of the school uniform, getting the kit together, listening to the instructions, then you line up, you hit all once, you run around, and then you go back to the queue. So actually, that hour can be very small amounts of activity. So I think the real need is about actually ensuring it's quality activity and that it is activity, it's not small bite size. But then I guess there's also a big move to active classrooms 
so activity shouldn't just be confined to the two hours of PE. That classrooms, you can be more active, you can be moving around. And there's a lot of work going on trying to help raise awareness of that for teachers. And I think that that's probably a really good avenue, as well as things like active transport, that will all lead to those increases. The Swedish context had all that in place, and they were still in it. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. So they just doubled the amount of PE clubs, so they didn't do any other changes, they just doubled the hours. So, um, when you look at the amount of MVPA that they were getting, it's not a straightforward four hours. So they still weren't doing four hours of moderate to great physical activity, but they had four hours in the curriculum for PE. So they were doing more than they had been in terms of the control schools. Um, but there's still a need to actually increase the amount of activity. But I guess that's a challenge because in schools there's a real you know, teachers under pressure to try and get you know, increase in terms of attainment. So there's often in some parts of the US there's no mandatory PE, which is just atrocious. You know? But they're under pressure, so I think it's about trying to get that balance and also help teachers realise that you can be learning different things while being active. And I think that's probably the second thing to take on My second thing to see if anyone just jump in if you want to My second area of interest really um, is talked about gender differences. Um, the impact, I'll use the word affluence, so I'm not using the word class, I'm not using the word regional deprivation or areas of multiple deprivation, but do you want to, can you comment on the impact of affluence on what well, we do? In our longitudinal research, we controlled for social economic status and that was through maternal education and also um, income and maternal IQ so we did control for that to some extent which meant that our findings were regardless of social economic status now obviously you're saying like affluence is slightly separate from that but we did try to take that into account as much as we could we weren't able to control for household income if we didn't have that sort of information there are certainly suggestions if you look at inequalities that sport can reduce inequalities. Um, and actually, in terms of inequalities and in attainment, we know that there's huge range of difference in terms of even the starting off points of kids going into school that affluence, if you like, will have an impact in terms of just how they start when they begin school. Like whether they're used to focusing their attention, you know, using their memory skills. And this does have a big impact. And actually the, the attainment gap seems to be widening as kids go throughout school. So actually trying to use what we know that physical activity can in some way improve cognition and it might improve it more for those at the lowest starting point, suggesting that actually this is a real way that we could try and influence, have a positive effect in terms of those inequalities. I think I need to be careful about what I say. <laughs> no, you're absolutely, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're absolutely right in terms of caution. This was my last, last curiosity. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could go on for ages, but mm. I, you know, my last curiosity is, yeah, I'm not a cognitive psychologist, mm -hmm. not even a psychologist, so it's it's this definition of long term yeah. and what is long term and what gets policy traction, mm -hmm. you know, and if, not me, mm -hmm. but if one, if one, not me, but if one was being mischievous and you wanted to get policy traction, I mean, there is policy traction because mm -hmm. of you use the word pandemic mm -hmm. in terms of growing in activity levels and you drew the relationship between physical activity and educational attainment. Mm -hmm. um, the curiosity bit of me over another definition of long term was to say if you compare the 1960s with mm -hmm. 2015 and you were to say inactivity, look, inactivity levels have dropped dramatically mm -hmm. or I don't know, but just mm -hmm. that trend, just say there's a trend yeah. of 20, 1960 to 2014, but because of all your the cautious nature, you would not you would not go as far as saying, because of these growing inactivity levels, there is a clear case to be made that educational attainment in Scotland has also dropped between 1960 and 2015. So it's that trend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. You know, so it's the trend yeah. between, on the one hand, physical activity, yeah. trends up and down, yeah. and the relationship between educational attainment yeah. and the, you know, the 
incredibly well informed research mm -hmm. stories that you're telling about yeah. how we can influence educational yeah. attainment. But if you were, you know, if you were a politician, you'd be really mm -hmm. worried if yeah. you, you know, if you were saying that educational attainment's mm -hmm. dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a clear relationship between A mm -hmm. and B. Yeah. Look at 1960. Look at 2015. Mm -hmm. We need to go to four hours. Yeah. I'm, that's the kind of picture that's in yeah. my head. But, yeah. But I'm really, my curiosity yeah. is that long term and you know, yeah. what is long term. And I think there's, so I guess there's a few things that need to be kind of cautious about. So one's the Flynn effect, I don't know if that's the term, that, um, which basically shows that year on year, um, so standard IQ tests and any standard test need to be renormed every 10 years because we see this gradual increase in terms of overall attainment. Um, and there's a wonderful, um, TED talk by James Flynn that talks about it. Okay? Um, and he's not saying that if we look to our performance on IQ tests relative to people's performance in the 1960s, we'd be scoring quite substantially more. That doesn't mean that there were more intelligent, it just means that actually the environment has changed considerably. So the types of questions that are in IQ tests now are the norms in terms of you know, school tests and training, whereas they might have been slightly different in terms of the 60s. So we have to take these sorts of measurement into account as well, but, and also that we're in a very different environment in terms of technology, and that's having a huge impact in terms of the types of abilities that we're learning and that we're focusing on. So very different environment in terms of now the 60s. Um, I guess the other side of that, though, is that in these long longitudinal birth cohorts, there does still seem to be this long-term relationship, not just in terms of five and six years, but 20 years and longer so we do see but the measurement again is difficult because in the 1960s they weren't using accelerometers in the same way that we are now so I think I totally take on board your point but I think we need to be cautious about how mm. to compare that. Clear a lady on top of our subject it's been absolutely fascinating thank you very much for Thanks. coming to share your research and time with us so as we call things to an end unless anyone wants to ask one last question are we all okay here? Mm. Just on okay. your behalf to thank Josie for, uh, for a great session. Great. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.